friends welcome back to my channel I'm Jenny and I'm here today to uh, chat to you a bit about uh, my upcoming vlogs for booktube prize so I ended up reading this is only the second round I'm reading um, in the final round I read round two and I read nonfiction and I was really surprised when I saw the results of round three of the semi-final to see that the three books, the top three books that went through in my group from round two were in the final. Um, I don't think I've ever had that or seen that before. Uh, that could be that it's happened. I just didn't notice before in book two prize, but I was really surprised by that. So, uh, how this is going to work for me is I'm going to be doing what I typically do, which is um, my reading vlogs of each book in Booktube Prize. Sorry, I'm just getting them. Ugh. And uh, I think I will probably, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I will release one vlog per book or if I will put them all together or how I will do that. Um, but that will all come out in the editing later on. So uh, today I'll just like let you know what the books are that I have in my category. So the three books that I've already read are An Immense World by Ed Yong. Uh, his name is George Floyd by Robert Smith and Toulouse Olonuripa and uh, Paradise Falls by Keith O'Brien. So, read all of those. I just noticed there's only one female author in the final. <laughs> so the one female author that made it is uh, My Fourth Time We Drowned, Seeking Refuge on the World's Deadliest Migration Route by Sally Hayden. And Sally Hayden is a journalist focused on migration, conflict, and humanitarian crises. Her reporting has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Guardian, the Financial Times Magazine, Vice, and elsewhere, and been featured on CNN International, Al Jazeera, and the BBC. So, um, I'm curious about this one because I really loved a book, this was, uh, two or three years ago for book two prize that I read, which was also about being an immigrant and migration, which I will put here because I can't remember what it's called right now, even though I, I did really like that book. So that book didn't make it past round two whenever I read it or round three. And I thought it was a really good, really good book. So I'm curious to read this one to see how it compares. I mean, it's a totally different type of book because this is written by a journalist that studies these issues and not by someone that's gone through it themselves so um mm, we'll see um but this one is not the first one i'm going to read <laughs> and then the other one that i'm not going to read for first is eating to extinction the world's rarest foods and why we need to save them by dan saladino so this is probably the lightest of the three i would say uh, topic wise and um, I'm currently reading a nonfiction and I think when I'm done reading that one I will kind of start dipping into this one maybe depending on how fast the other one goes which is the escape artist the man who broke out of Auschwitz just to warn the world by Jonathan Friedland um, so I believe Jonathan Friedland is didn't he write no he did not okay um i thought he had written a book that i had read i'm mixing him up with someone else because i have not read any of his work so i decided to start with this one um and I, it sounds very good. It sounds like it potentially would move pretty fast, uh, which is kind of one of the reasons I picked it, but also because I, um, I don't know why I picked this one first. I just did. It was just instinct, I guess. 
So uh, this is what I'm going to read. And I am a little bit, I'm a little bit not worried. What's the word I'm looking for? I'm, I'm wondering what the future, and I think Robert is also wondering this, about the future of the Book 2 Prize and how the Book 2 Prize is going to evolve. I feel like in terms of popularity and in terms of generating buzz and all those things, there's been a bit of a plateau here with it. Um, and so I think that's interesting. And Robert has actually been asking for feedback from the judges around this to try to see how we we would like to see it grow and change and evolve. Um, so that's a really interesting thing because when you're thinking about something that's so monumental in scope that Robert has put together, um, you know, it really does make you wonder about what participation means and how that affects everyone and what you can contribute to th this is this is where my brain goes i know that everyone's like that but i'm like how can i contribute to um keeping it going to building it more to to continuing it as a project because i think it's a worthy project and i think it's a really fun thing to participate in so I've been thinking about that uh, here and there um, with those these emails that Robert have sent and the, on the surveys and things. And um, yeah, it's very interesting. So I'm not sure where that's going to go. And I think also for myself, what I have noticed uh, in participating in the Book 2 Prize is that I've been reluctant to commit to reading every round and i feel like you need some judges that are you know really willing to commit to reading every round because you need the quantity of the judges but you also need that like passion for these books and i would say you know i am passionate about books but in a different way than reading the newest books so for me like reading these 2022 releases is actually um something that's you know a change for my for my reading because I don't usually seek out new releases very much. So that's one thing about the Book 2 Prize that I actually like is that I end up reading books that faster maybe than I normally would. Um, but I do feel sometimes like I don't want to be prescribed what I'm reading. I just want to read what I feel like reading. So there's that as well. But anyway, I am digressing. I will check in with you again when I have gotten halfway through The Escape Artist by Jonathan Friedland. Hey everyone. So I am halfway through The Escape Artist by Jonathan Friedland. Uh, so this is a very well-written book. It reads like fiction, really, uh, even though you know it's nonfiction. I'm, I'm very much enjoying it. However, it's also... An extremely difficult book to read. Um, I know way more about concentration camps than I ever, during World War II, than I ever really wanted to know. Um, the details, of course, are harrowing and very difficult to read. Um, but um, if these people could survive such horrible circumstances and endure them, um, then I can certainly read about them. But yes, um, it is not for the faint of heart, um, as you know, anything to do with the Holocaust during World War II would be. Um, but certainly, Walter, Walter's life, um, because his name at the beginning of the book is Walter, not Rudolf Verba, um, is incredible what he went through, what he, the way he managed this horrid, horrid situation, all of that is just absolutely incredible. So, um, halfway and I will check in again when I have finished the book. Hello. All right. So last night I did my first finish of book two prize 2023. 
nonfiction final round finish the escape artist the man who broke out of auschwitz to warn auschwitz to warn the world by jonathan friedland okay so this took me longer to read than i thought it would and i think a huge reason for that is because of the subject matter um because despite the fact that there was this is extremely well written it reads i mean it definitely is non-fiction but you feel like you're wrapped up in the story the same way you would be in a novel i think but despite that um it was very hard to read i mean uh i know more now about concentration camps during world war ii than i ever really wanted to know but i think that the important thing here is that uh, this is a story that um, reveals the layers of situations. So I think especially for my generation certainly, and even my parents' generation being baby boomers, there's a way that World War II is mythologized, is talked about, is romanticized even. I would go to say in our culture and so while some people don't enjoy reading about war or feel like you know the topic has been done to death through novels through films through nonfiction since you know for the last 50 years um, there are still stories that are not being told and level layers of the of the of the history that are not being revealed. And so this book is uncovering more layers of that history that are important for people to understand. And so one of the most important aspects of this book that I think was really revealed in the second half was the fact that Rudolf Verba, um, who who started life as Walter Rosenberg and then changed his name to Rudolf Verba when he escaped Auschwitz, um, he there were certain things as a teenager trapped in a concentration camp that kept him going and that pushed him to escape. And when he escaped and got out into the world and shared his information, the reaction was not what he had anticipated people were much more indifferent to the to him and to the situation than he had suspected and i think part of that could be attributed to being a teenager and having a strong sense of justice and not having the life experience to understand that that humans are not do not all have that sense of justice and they often are passive, they often are, are um, take the path of least resistance, they often look out for themselves and the head of others, and that there's a lot of parts of human nature that are very disappointing and that are very um, frustrating when you're talking about something as monumental as the Holocaust, in which there were many people who, not just the Nazis, I think it was very black and white for him, the Nazis are bad, everyone else is, the allies are good, and they're gonna save us, they're gonna save the, the, the Jewish people that they can. And when he got out, he realized that was not the case. So this monumental escape, this, in, this ability to endure the, the worst of human nature and, and suffering, to get out into the world, and then to have people not react in a way that seems appropriate given the magnitude of what is happening that is a really huge part of what this book is about and it is extremely frustrating right it's extremely frustrating to know that there were allies americans british prime minister and president who knew what was happening and who decided that they had to go for the greater good here um that they weren't going to do certain things that would have prevented more jewish people from being taken to concentration camps specifically hungarian jews um so certainly in the end the nazis were defeated but there are questions as to whether or not more Jewish people could have been saved from the concentration camps if action would have been taken sooner. And 
Rudolf Verba believed that for most of his life. Um, he went on to live a quite long life after with having children, having um, a, a couple of marriages and, you know, advocating for uh, like sharing his voice, going to trials at Nuremberg, like just really. Um, and, and it was interesting because he wasn't the typical Holocaust survivor that many of us have encountered in other ways. He was a very verbose person. He was very um, talkative. He was very alive and, and aggressive about what he felt were injustices that occurred after he was out of Auschwitz. So like, so for all of those reasons, I think this is an excellent book. Um, if you are someone that wants to know, like, details of World War II and wants to know all of the things like this is another book you should add to your repertoire there's really important information in here there's really important nuance in here about the behind the scenes workings of this of World War II and what some people knew and what some people didn't know what people refused to share what that meant for lots of people um, and it's also about belief and knowledge it's about the fact that there's a strange thing in human nature where even if someone presents you with black and white evidence and facts you can choose not to believe those things and that is also a part of the the, the overall theme of this book that despite the fact that there was evidence there was proof right in front of people's noses they chose not to believe it so why what part of human nature does that it's quite fascinating um it's quite frustrating on on many levels but uh, i thought this was excellent um and yeah i'm moving on now to another book and i will check in with you when i have gotten halfway through the next one Hey everyone, so I'm halfway through my fourth time we drowned. So I'm finding it really difficult to read this book. <laughs> uh, the subject matter is difficult. The subject matter of this book is very heavy. Um, we are talking about Eritrean and uh, some uh, Sierra Leone based um, refugees, people who are fleeing their home countries for various reasons, for wanting a better life, trying to immigrate, but in doing so they are being prevented from entering Europe um, and are being detained in um, detention centers in Libya and these detention centers are basically you know, people have compared them to concentration camps. They are um, terrible places where pe women are raped and children and women and men are, you know, not fed properly. They're not, they don't even know where to, to be cared for properly if they're sick. There's a lot of tuberculosis and terrible, terrible things. The guards um, are wanting to be bribed, you know, after these people have been um, trying to get these smugglers to get them across the Mediterranean. It's it's a very heavy subject matter and it's very depressing because when you see that the UN and um, these different committees who are supposed to be helping re these refugees, um, they're not actually helping them and a lot of them are, the, the organizations themselves are corrupt or are, uh, you know, complacent because they they get to have their cushy job and live in a warm city and swim in a pool and stay at nice hotels while they're trying to do this work where these people are you know having one meal a day if they're lucky and are being stripped of their human rights just because they're trying to pursue a better life they're not criminals <laughs> um so it's really challenging to read this because it's it feels very um, bleak. So that's where I am 
in um, My Fourth Time We Drowned. I think it's well written. It's interspersed with quotes from people that Sally Hayden has corresponded with through social media and through her own phone. Um, and so you're hearing people's testimonials about their lives and you're hearing her journey in trying to report these things and in trying to hold people to account for what is not being done to, to help these people while thousands of people are dying in various different ways, whether it's drowning or um, being killed by corrupt guards or um, smugglers. And um, it's breaking families apart. It's, it's very, very bleak. So... That's where we are at the middle of this book, and I will check in again when we've gotten to the end. Hey everybody, so I finished uh, my fourth time we drowned, Seeking Refuge on the World's Deadliest Migration Route by Sally Hayden. And I will not, I'm not going to lie, I really struggled with this book. <laughs> um, I don't think it's because of the a fault of the book. I think the book does what it sets out to do, which is very clearly and um, honestly depict the situation for migrants trying to leave Africa and get to Europe, the ridiculous amounts of um, corruption that are involved, not just in terms of smugglers and um, you know people taking advantage in Africa, but also in the European Union and how um, misguided and xenophobic, like racist, all the things. They just, they are trying to keep people out of Europe and in doing so, they're um, creating horrendous conditions that people are being held in in Libya that are, of course, violating human rights and doing terrible things. So that was part of why I felt it was such a struggle. This book is so, it's very hard to read. It's very depressing. It's very disheartening to read the level of corruption within the United Nations and um, you know, sending people off to be these heroes, but they're actually living, you know, kind of lives of luxury with high daily stipends and they're not actually helping people because they can't actually help people because there's a level of, um, of disconnect between people like your uh, countries throwing money at African countries and telling them to keep the migrants, um, away and the level of corruption that that money passes down through it's just um it's unbelievable and then once these refugees leave these con if they get out if they are able to get across the water and get into a country where they can start a new life then they're carrying these terrible experiences with them for decades for the rest of their lives basically and so there's no there's not a lot of hope in this book there's not a lot of um, there's no solutions. This is just a reportage of what is happening and what Sally Hayden has been exposing and trying to expose. And so that's what it is. It's an expose of this situation, um, condensing her many writings for many different journalistic, um, in, you know, institutions together. Um, it's not, it's not essays. It is a, a full book. Um, but, um, so yeah, so I found it very hard to read and obviously me finding this hard to read is nothing compared to the situation of these people going through these scenarios. So, you know, I, I understand the level of privilege I have by saying something like that, but, um, you know, it's just, while I think it's a super important book and while I think this is a terrible, terrible situation that is going on and that needs to be addressed, it's also very... Um, difficult to know where what I can do as an individual to help these people who are going through horrendous situations and, and a lot of whom are dying because of, of um, the privilege that I have in, in this country is, you know, directly 
colonization, I think the, I think the, the main point of this book is that colonization has drastically and irrevocably perhaps destroyed entire nations of people and has created a huge gap between who those that have and those that don't along with many other factors but colonization is at its heart just a terrible reality and and this book is another example of that um so I, I think it was well written. I think it is it is worth reading if you've got if you've got your head in the right place and you can handle the level of um, frustration and disappointment in humanity as a whole that this book uh, brings out or shows or depicts. Um, but uh, in terms of like something that I think would win a literary prize. <laughs> You know, I think uh, I, I, I'm not going to put it up high on my list. I'll say that for now. So that is my fourth time we drowned. I now have to finish Eating to Extinction in a very short amount of time. I, I thought I got kind of cocky and thought that I could finish three books with no problem. But these books ended up being very dense and actually quite challenging to read through for my mental state at this time. So um, I'm hoping Eating to Extinction is a quicker read and that I can get it done uh, in about a week. I'll check in again when I have gotten halfway through Eating to Extinction. Hey everyone. Okay, so I've made it to halfway through Eating to Extinction by Dan Saladino. Um, I'm struggling quite a bit to get, <laughs> to get this book finished in time. Today is September 24th, so I have five five days I'd like to finish this by Friday uh, to finish the rest of this book and um, it is I actually think it's a great book um, what it, it, it's covering different foods and as he's covering these rare foods he's also relaying the story around the industries in which these foods um, kind of contrast. So, for example, if he's talking about meat, he's talking about chickens. He gives us the history of the domestication of his chickens briefly, and then talks about the varietal of chickens that, um, that we have today that is the main one that's like dominant in the, in the industry. And then he talks about uh, a very rare Korean chicken that um, has been preserved by a certain farmer. And so that's kind of the way a lot of the book goes. And um, it's really interesting to learn these details because I think the way he's relaying the information is fairly unique. Uh, I don't read a lot about food. I have read Eating Animals, I've read some other books that relay, uh, you know, industrialization, um, you know, breeding, that type of thing, uh, is, is kind of covered in here. So I'm learning new things and I think the essence of the book is thus far at halfway is, uh, really well en encompassed in this quote by, um, a farmer that he chats to about a certain type of rice, the red mouth gl glutinous rice that this farmer has developed and or is continuing to grow basically because as as we develop these modern versions of rice that are easier to to get you know to get to market basically cheaper, easier and make the most money because in the end a lot of this comes down to making money from food it's not really about nutrition it's not really about um local it's about making money right the food food is industry so this uh farmer says um we need to find better ways of living and farming maybe some answers can be found in our traditions and I think that that's kind of the essence of what this book is trying to explain is that, you know, diversity is really important in plants and things like avian flu 
and different blights that can affect crops are more likely to happen when we monoculture everything, when all of the farmers are growing the same type of corn or the same type of potato, um, that all the chickens are from the same breed. They don't have enough diversity to fight off viruses and different disease that will kill them. And so it sends a lot of these industries into crisis mode where they're having to kill millions of animals or their um, their crops are dying in the fields and these farmers are losing their income because it, everyone thinks that homogenizing everything and making everything taste a certain one way is the answer so there's really interesting theories going on in here um yeah so you know it's a really i think that the points that are that this author is making in this book are ones that are very important for our future um, and our ability to survive and the ability of the plants that we uh, have around us to um, to make it through and to be nutritious still. Um, there's just so much, there's so much around food that he's discussing in here that I think is super important. So I will check in with you again when I have finished Eating to Extinction. Hello everybody, so I did it. I finished Eating to Extinction by Dan Saladino. This is the last read for Book Two Prize, nonfiction round 2023. So this is an excellent book. It's excellent. Um, I learned a lot in this book and I think it's gonna be rated highly for me in my rankings. Um, so what it does well, for, in my opinion, is it, the length of the chapters, the way he broke down the foods, um, the, the, the information he shared was just enough information to keep it interesting, but not too much to make you overwhelmed. Um, I, I know in reading some reviews that not everyone felt that way about this book, um, but for me, I rarely found myself drifting off in attention. There was a few times, but I think that was more about fatigue and maybe the exact, like the certain food that he was talking about where sometimes I would, might drift a little bit. But overall, I was really engaged. I learned a lot about these foods, the people who are keeping them alive, um, the processes that you know, humans go through to take something that's in its raw form is inedible and then becomes this amazing tasting thing. Um, so yeah, I really enjoyed that. And I think that I, th I'm really glad this book made it to the final round because I don't think people, I don't think these types of books usually do, uh, because they, they, this is a really hard-hitting topic. It is about climate change. It is about foods that are going extinct. It is about ways of life that are being destroyed, whether that's through um, deforestation, colonization, war, or um, capitalist markets that are like um, homogenizing everything. So that is a heavy topic. But the way it's presented here is in a very digestible way and I think a lot of times the nonfiction finals tend to be these really heavy hard hitting books if you look at a lot of the other books in this category um my fourth time we drowned the escape artist um his name is George Floyd they're all very heavy topics that can can really be just so depressing in ways to read this one definitely carries that in it but what you're learning about is how brilliantly diverse our food is all around the world and how so many people are working to preserve that and I found that quite uplifting and quite hopeful as a read and very informative um so 
that is the final read. Um, and I'm really glad that I was reading a nonfiction because I definitely would not have picked up this book on my own. I just wouldn't have. Um, and so that is one of the benefits if you're looking for a plug for joining Book Two Prize next year, one of the benefits of reading in the nonfiction category is that you will find these types of gems of books that you would never have picked up on your own and that you end up really enjoying. You also get the opposite, which is books that you would never have picked up on your own and books that you don't still didn't want to read. Um, but hopefully you get more of the ones you do appreciate having read. So that's that's but it is a plug please um consider it i think it's a great way to read more nonfiction. for me it's a great way to read more recent nonfiction because i tend to read nonfiction based on my interests at the time and that doesn't mean that there's a new um up to, like like a new and hot off the press book that's gonna be on that topic so often i'm reading books that are older um in terms of publication date around nonfiction. So yeah, I am also going to be making a video about my rankings. So that is going to be a separate video from this one. Whether or not it is already out or not, um, I will eventually be linking it in the description box below. But you can always go onto my channel to the Book 2 Prize playlist and all of my Book 2 Prize related books are in that playlist. So I will link that below and probably at the end of this video as well. Thank you so much for watching this year's Book 2 Prize uh, vlogs, if you've made it through all of them. Um, I most likely will be reading again next year. And um, I really wish that the translated fiction was coming back because that was definitely my favorite um, out of all the years I've read. But um, until we get enough judges, we just can't have that category too. So uh, thank you so much for watching. And I will be back again soon with another video.